Okay, thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. This is Designing Online Quizzes in eClass. And on behalf of uh, the Office of Online Learning, I'd like to thank you for um, coming and supporting our Lunch and Learn series. This is the first of, I believe, five webinars that we're going to offer throughout this semester. And they're gonna be on ranging topics. And we've distributed some posters through the divisions to kind of advertise those. So if you're interested in um, you know, coming to some more that we're gonna be offering throughout the semester, you can certainly uh, do the same process that you did today, which was just log right into that, um, that link that we provided you on the date and time of the webinar, and all, that's all you have to do. Okay, so again, thank you for coming and welcome. Uh, we'd like to begin by letting you know that this webinar is going to be recorded. We will be sending you a link to the recording with some additional resources after the webinar is ended, and we are also planning on posting this recording on our resource website. Um, so it's going to be publicized to uh, Mount St. Mary College and faculty and staff. You won't be required to speak through the microphone or use your webcam during the webinar, so don't worry about trying to troubleshoot any of your technology um, as we begin here and we'll use the chat feature to communicate back and forth. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please write your questions down as we go along if you have any, and we'll have a little chat session at the end um, where we can do a question and answer. So we'll just begin briefly about telling you who you're going to be talking to today. Again, my name is Kayla Gorey, and I'm the project coordinator in the Office of Online Learning. I'm William Beersack. I'm the graduate assistant for the Office of Online Learning and a graduate student for the Division of Education. Hi, my name is Vanna Hong. I'm also one of the graduate assistants of the Office of Online Learning, and I'm also a, a graduate student to the School of Nursing. So thank you guys. So we'll jump right in and we'll talk about what the benefits are of using the quiz feature in eClass. So first off, it's obviously built in right into the learning management system, which is provided to all faculty members at the college who teach um, any courses, whether they're traditional undergraduate courses, adult accelerated courses, any courses that are offered throughout a given semester, all are given a blank e-class shell or an e-class site. And in that site, you can do whatever you'd like. You can upload your syllabus, your, um, your PowerPoint presentations, or you could use it to actually facilitate activities, which is what we're gonna talk about today in specifically quizzes. It allows you to give instant feedback for students, which is nice for both students and you. It allows for in-depth question analysis by the instructor, which means it allows you to kind of look after you've uh, given your quiz and you can look at the attempts that your students have made. You can actually view the questions and see which questions maybe were um, a little challenging for them, or maybe you can rephrase to make them a little more challenging, depending on what your needs are for the quiz. It allows for automatic grading and the connection to the eClass gradebook. So if you're utilizing the eClass gradebook, which again is built in right into the LMS eClass, um, you can set it up so that it automatically grades and it enters the grade right into the gradebook. So you don't actually have to manually enter anything. It helps the instructor to create a paperless classroom, which is obviously very environmentally friendly, but also easier on you because you don't have to lug around all 50 or so quiz papers or test exams. And it also has some built-in strategies to reduce academic dishonesty, which is a main concern about a lot of faculty who are interested in putting things up online. They're worried about that um, and how that differs from a face-to-face -face class versus online. And the best part about it is that you can reuse them again every semester. So if you are to teach your course again and you've created this quiz and it's online and you've facilitated it and you uh, decide that you're gonna do it again next semester, it's already created, you're already done. Maybe you have to make a few revisions to it, but the bulk of it is ready for you to go and we can help facilitate that uh, process in our office. So now that you know what the benefits are, we're actually gonna hop right in and we're going to do a little bit of screen sharing throughout our webinar. We're gonna show you the process of creating the quiz, all of the settings, how to build a question bank, and some other considerations that you might wanna think about when you're designing and implementing quizzes in your online, uh, in, in, an, in a course, not necessarily an online course, any course can use the quiz feature in eClass. Okay, so if you bear with me, I'm just going to switch from our presentation to um, my screen where I'm going to show you um, a mock site that we've created for the purposes of today's webinar. 
Okay, so let me know if you can't see uh, my webpage here. I have an e-class site up that we, again, we've created for the purposes of our webinar so that we can uh, demonstrate some things for you today. So as you can see, this is just a regular e-class space. Um, again, everybody is given them throughout every semester, every teacher, every faculty member who teaches is given a blank one and they can use that um, at their convenience. If you're not familiar with our learning management system and you've never used it before, the one thing that you should know about when you enter your course for the first time and you want to add anything, whether it's a file or it's um, a, your PowerPoints or it's actually an activity like a quiz or a discussion forum, the very first thing you need to do is turn your editing on, which is located up in the top right corner of your uh, course page. So I'll go ahead and click that. And now you can see that a few things have shown up. Uh, we have some gears on every topic space. These are different topics, as you can see. In your course, it may just say topic one, topic two, topic three, or it could say the dates of the weeks. Uh, that's totally customizable to you. But every section has its own little gear here, and this is for the uh, editing feature for the space. So if you wanted to, um, you know, add an image like we did, uh, revise the title of the section, add some preliminary text here. That's what you would do. You would click those wheels. For today's demonstration, I'm going to focus on this link here called Add an Activity or Resource. And you'll see that that's uh, part of every single section of your course. And what you're going to do is you're going to navigate to the space that you want to add your item, whether it's a quiz or a file or what have you. And you're going to click that in that specific space. So I'm going to go ahead and click Add an Activity or Resource. And as you can see, it's brought up a new menu where I can choose from a number of activities or resources. The list is quite long. Um, the good thing is, is if you are interested in learning about any of, of these, there's some brief um, introductory text here that tells you a little bit about how each functions. So for today, I'm going to click on Quiz, and then I'm going to click Add. Now you'll see that a new screen pops up and it's going to ask you to enter some preliminary information. So for today's demonstration, I'm just going to call it test one. Underneath the name, you'll see that you have an opportunity to give the test a description. This can be anything you want. You can be as detailed as possible and you, actually you don't even need to put anything at all. It's totally up to you. Some professors prefer to put um, some directions here about what they expect out of the students or just some basic information about um, the test itself. So for demonstrations purposes, I'm just going to write this test is for chapter one. Underneath that, you can say display description on course page. You can select this option. What this option does is it allows you to display your description underneath the title of your exam right on your course page. This is nice because it allows your students to kind of see your description before they even have to click on the test. So if you have a number of things in your e-class, you have your syllabus, you have a bunch of files, resources you've added already, it may be nice to add a little bit of a description just so the student doesn't have to click around and try to find out what exactly this quiz is about or what exactly is expected of them. Underneath that, you can see there's a number of other options here, and we are going to get into a few of them in detail a little bit later. But for time's sake, I'm going to click Save and Return to Course for now, so I can show you exactly what this looks like on the course page. Okay, so it reloaded our course page, and you can see our test has been created here. And because I selected Displayed Course Description on the course page, it's, a, it's allowing the students to see exactly that text. This test is for Chapter 1. Again, you can be as detailed as possible or you don't even have to write anything. It's totally a personal preference. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Billy and Billy is going to talk a little bit about creating your question bank, which is going to be your next step in the process of creating the test. And he's going to show you a couple of the most commonly used question types in eClass um, and how those function. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, so now we have created a quiz activity within our eClass course, but in the meantime, it's blank. We haven't added any content to it yet. So where should we begin with constructing the quiz? Now, my suggestion is to create a question bank for all the quiz content you intend to use. A question bank is a central repository in your eClass course, which can be accessed by any quiz you create for your course. And there are several benefits to that. 
First and foremost, by using a question bank, you're able to reuse the question content you create in future assessments. So for example, if you create a quiz question for a low stakes test early on in the semester, you're able to then use it again later in a maybe a cumulative assessment. Second, having your question content located in a question bank allows for new levels of randomization in your quizzes. As Vanna will mention later, there are functions for randomly importing questions into a quiz activity so that each student gets a unique and random test form with the questions from your question bank. So those instructors that are concerned with academic dishonesty, please keep this in mind for later. Also, drafting and formatting your question content beforehand will help when you later need to consider grading and timing settings for your quiz. For example, the frequency and the difficulty level of your question content may influence what you might perceive as appropriate for timing constraints or the allowed number of attempts on a quiz. So now we're going to be sharing our screen again to de demonstrate how to create categories within your question bank and to organize your content. Also, we'll be sharing the steps to creating certain basic question types within E-Class. So if you'll bear with me a moment, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we're now back again within our test E-Class course. So to get into my question bank, I'll begin by going over into the administrator block. I have it located over on the left side. And I'm going to look and make sure that course administration is open right now. So I see that it is. I'm going to go down to the very bottom and click on question bank. And within that menu, I'm going to click on categories. So this is our categories page. And you'll see now that there's a default category for the course you're in. You also see that I have some categories that I previously made. And you may see that my view of this page contains a little more information than yours will. So let's focus for now on this default category that we have here. So you can think of all these categories as file folders for the question content you create. And this way, you can organize by perhaps topic, question type, or even the tests that these questions are intended for. So here are the steps to creating a new category within your question bank. First, scroll to the very bottom of the Edit Categories page. Then you have to select the parent category you want the new category to be nested in. So for now, I'm going to keep it within the default course category. And then I need to insert a unique name for the incoming category. And I'm going to name it Test 1, given that I'm creating these questions for the Test 1 activity that we made earlier. And I'm going to click on Add Category. And so when the page loads, you can see that our new category has been created. So now with that completed, I can now add questions to populate this category. So I'm going to begin by going back to the administration block, going back into our question bank tab, and clicking on questions now. All right, so now we are on the questions page where you can create and insert questions into certain categories. So I'm going over to this drop down bar in the top. And I'm going to find the category that I created just now, test one. All right. So now I'm going to begin adding questions by selecting the Create a New Question button. And you'll see this pop-up menu appear with many question types. So this is similar to the pop-up menu that you see when you insert new activities or resources into your eClass course. You can see that there's many options. You can click on the options and get a little brief description of the question types that are available. So for now, I'm going to focus on a few basic question types that are very common for certain assessment types. And so I'll start with multiple choice questions today. So I selected multiple choice. I'm going to go ahead and click on Add. So this right here is the form for creating a multiple choice question within eClass. Now, eClass provides teachers with a lot of flexibility when creating this common question type. Instructors can create single answer questions that allow for only one answer to be chosen using radio buttons. And there's also an option for multiple answer questions, which allow one or more answers to be chosen by providing checkboxes next to the answers. So let's get started with building it. So first, you need to, first thing you need to do is create a question name, a descriptive name that allows you to identify this question in the question bank. Now, the students won't see this question. This is only for your organizational purposes only. So for me, I like to number my questions. So I'm just going to name this question one. 
The next step is to create the question text. Now, this is going to be the question or the prompt that the students will respond to. So I have a prompt already prepared. I'm just going to copy and paste right in to spare you the need to watch me type. So uh, mine's uh, in social sciences. Mesopotamia was the site of the earliest developments in the Neolithic Revolution, which are the two rivers that Mesopotamia was situated between. So now that I have my question text, next I have to look at the default points. So this is the maximum point value that this question will be worth. So uh, it's by default, it's always set at one, and I can increase this or decrease this if I decide that I want to weight this question differently compared to other questions. But for now, I'm happy with one, so I'm going to keep it on there. Next, I have to choose whether the students are going to see one or multiple answers. So you see we have two options, one or multiple. So right now for this question, I'm going to keep it at multiple answers. So in this way, when the students are going to answer this quiz question, there's going to be check boxes and they can select multiple options. So now that all my settings and text for the question are completed, I now I can go and scroll down and create my answers. And now you'll see that there's different forms for different choice options. So these are the multiple answers that the students will get to choose from in the quiz question. So I'm going to begin with choice one. And I'll start copying and pasting my answers. My organizational style is I like to add in my correct answers first. By default, eClass will um, randomize all the answer options, so it will come up in a randomized order when it's seen on quiz. But for me and for my organizational purposes, I just put the correct ones first just to make sure that they're in there. So for this question, the answers are the Euphrates and the Tigris River, and now I have to give a grade for each of them. So because this, these are both correct answers and the students were going to have to choose both of them, I'm going to give them each a grade of 50%. Now, I'm doing this because the combined correct answers in a multiple answer question need to add up to 100% of the total points they can receive. This is different from a one answer question, wherein if you only have the one correct answer, the correct grade has to be 100% on it. So now that I have these two correct options on here, I'm going to scroll down and add some incorrect options. And for these, I'm going to, well, this one in particular, I'm going to keep it as none. But another option that a professor could do to uh, make sure that students are not just clicking every single checkbox, just for the hell of it, they could go scroll down and assign negative percentages to the question option. So if they get an incorrect answer, then they would receive credit off of the question. And as you can see, there's a wide variety of grading options for each, uh, for each answer option. So now I'm happy with this multiple choice question. So I'm going to go right down to the very, very bottom and click on Save Changes, which redirects us back to the question bank. And now you can see that we have our question bank, and question one is now populated within it. So if I wanted to, I could go back to question one and edit it with this gear symbol. But for now, all I need to do, all I want to do is click on this magnifying glass, the preview button, which allows me to preview the question as it will appear in the quiz. So as we can see, we have our question prompt right here. And our answer options, select one or more below. And our answers are right here with checkboxes. So I'm going to click on what I know to be the correct answers, click on check. And as you can see, they do come up correct, and it comes out as a correct answer, correct response in this question. So I'm going to start again. And now, and as you see, the answer is randomized in this iteration of the question. So I'm just going to randomly select some answers, click on check. And you can see that it's recognizing the incorrect answers as well as the correct. So I'm going to close the preview. And now I'm going to begin on a new question. So now I'm going to focus on the true false question type and add that. So for this, I'm going to start with a new question name. And again, I'm going to stick with numbers. So I'm going to name it question two. And now I have to add a question prompt for this too. So it can be a statement. It can be, uh, well, for true false, a statement would be the best uh, question prompt. 
and I'm going to go ahead and copy this in. Again, social sciences, so this one has to do with World War I. And you have to go and change your default points if you so wish. I'm going to keep mine at 1 for this particular question. Now, you can see that there's similarities in the form compared to the multiple choice form. But for true and false, instead of giving multiple answer options, you just have to, in this correct answer field, select whether true or false will be the correct response. Now, and I hope social sciences faculty will agree with me, but I believe true is the correct answer. And so that, so when the student has two options, true, false, true will be the correct answer. And now you can see that there's feedback responses for true and feedback responses for false. So an instructor could give feedback for each response type. And so if a student answers true, could give, well, in this case, true is correct, so they could put Excellent. You got it. Or for false, perhaps maybe referring to uh, refer to the textbook chapter on World War One. Yeah. So there's options so that uh, instructors can provide specific and constructive feedback to the students based on their responses. And the same does go for other question types as well. So with our multiple choice and uh, multiple choice question before each answer response could be given a specific feedback response so that um, based on how the student performs, they can get specific feedback that can help them develop further. So now I'm happy with the way this question turned out, so I'm going to click on Save Changes at the bottom. And as you can see, question two is now in our question bank. So I'm going to click on the Preview button to double check it. And everything looks good to me. I'm going to double check our correct answer, and as you can see, our feedback response came up. I'm going to do it one more time, click on false this time. Hey, yep, and everything came out as I expected it. So now I'm going to close the preview. I'm going to create one more new question type, and this time I'm going to do the short answer question. And again, I need to create a descriptive name that I will see, and only I will see, in the question bank. I'm going to name it question three because numbers help me. A different instructor might want a different naming convention, and that's perfectly all right. So now I'm going to create a question prompt. Uh, I think I'm going to make it college related now. So Mount St. Mary College is located in which city of New York State? Uh, I think this is a really important question for certain students to know. Uh, so I'm going to make it uh, default point three. And another option in the short answer question is whether you want the answers to be case sensitive. So this capitalization count. Newberg is a proper noun, so I'm going to say yes, the case must match. So, so once you give your question name, your prompt points, and the case sensitivity, then you can go ahead and provide any answers you would deem acceptable. So in this case, I'm going to say Newberg with a capital N is going to be the 100% answer, and I can provide feedback to the students. I can anticipate that some students might not capitalize the N, so I'm going to say new work is at the capital, and I'll give partial credit for that. And I can give feedback proper nouns get capitalized. And I also want to create a feedback response for any responses other than Newberg. So what I'm going to do is in answer three, I'm going to put an asterisk. And this indicates that this answer and this feedback response is going to be a wild card. So if any student provides an answer other than New Newberg with a capital N or Newberg with a lowercase, so anything other than the responses I've already indicated, they will be counted as a wild card. So I'll just give a little feedback response. I hope, like looking at Google Maps, someone will know. Oh, hey, Mount St. Mary College is in Newburgh, New York. So, so now I have all my answer responses, all my anticipated answer responses finished. So I'm happy with this question, and I'm going to click on Save Changes. And as we can see, question three is now in the question bank. I'm going to preview it for us. Mount St. Mary College is located in which city of New York State? Newburgh. 
with lowercase. And we say we got partial credit because it's indicated by the yellow and this partially correct indicator on the side. And we have our feedback in the bottom. So try it again with the capital. Came out correct. And one more time, I'm going to give a random answer. So I'm going to assume, say, I'm out of state and I have absolutely no idea which city we're in. So I'm going to say Orange County. So this would be counted as a wild card response because it's something other than what I've already designated. And it came out incorrect. And my standard feedback response to a wild card came up. It's not happy. So I'm going to close the preview. And there's one other um, feature of the uh, short answer question type that I want, want to share. So I'm going to edit question three that we just worked on. So what I want to show is how you can turn a short answer question into a like, fill in the blank. So as you saw before in our preview, we had the answer prompt and then an answer box below it. So what I'm going to show you is how to put a answer box in the middle of the question or the statement rather to fill in the blank. So I'm going to quickly edit the question I just had. So Mount Sinai College is located in the city of... And I'm going to insert some underscores here along with a comma. So now it reads, Mount St. Mary College is located in the city of blank New York. And so my answers still apply. So I'm just going to go to the bottom, save changes, and preview. So now you see, instead of having the answer box below, it now has the answer box in the middle of the question. Mount St. Mary College is located in the city of Newburgh, New York, check and it still functions the same way. Now, just as a side note, we see this checkbox in the bottom of our preview, and this is just for our purposes so that we can check it. In a standard um, deferred feedback quiz, this checkbox wouldn't appear. Each student would have to fill out each question, and then they wouldn't get feedback or points until after the professor chooses to give it to them. So I'm going to go ahead and close this preview. Now, there are many question types available to instructors within eClass. Um, those interested in learning more about our, the, your options can come to the Office of Online Learning for some one-on-one -on -one instruction. And in addition, there are many online resources that demonstrate how these question types can be utilized and we can direct you to them as well. So now without further ado, I'm going to direct attention over to Vanna, who will teach you more about constructing an online quiz using the questions you create in the question bank. Thanks, Billy. I let's see. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. But um, my name is Vanna. I am gonna talk to you about constructing your quiz. Here, I'm gonna discuss about importing questions to build your quiz content. Now that we created the categories and questions, you can begin importing selected questions from your quiz bank. And I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go back to eClass here. All right. Um, to begin, open the quiz activity and select Edit Quiz. The link will, will either be um, in the center of the page or under the administration block under Quiz Administration. So for now, we're going to use Test 1 as an example. Like I said, it's going to be in the middle of the screen here, or you can go on the side here that says edit quiz under administration. All right, and there are three different options to add questions to your quiz. To do that first, you would go to the right side here and it says add. There's going to be add a new question, add from the question bank, or add a random question. We're going to start by doing adding from the question bank that Billy had initiated. First, you have to um, select a category on top here. And since Billy did test one, we're going to choose that category to start off with. It'll give you the questions that are under that category specifically. And so far, we have three. So I'm going to click all three and then add selected questions to the quiz. And here, this is how it looks like after you do that. Um, let's see. 
If you want to add a new question, instead of using the questions from your question bank, you can use the add a new question feature, which is here. And since Billy discussed this earlier in more detail about the different types of questions, such as multiple choice, short answer, true and false, I won't have to repeat again, but it's the same um, process. And then you click add and go from the different steps. Lastly, um, adding a random question is a similar function to the add from the question bank option. However, eClass will randomly select a question from a given category. Again, you would press add and then add a random question. First, of course, you do um, you choose the category. And since we've already done um, the choices from test one that Billy had um, built, we're going to choose a different category. And we're going to choose multiple choice here. Then you click the number of random questions, and let's say we'll do all five. Then you click add a random question. And here, this is how it's displayed after you complete that. Now I'm going to show you the different features when constructing your quiz structure. Um, the first option is the repaginate, which is here on the, te on the top left corner. It allows you to manipulate the number of items that appear on each page of the quiz. You can go to the administration settings and hit preview once, um, once you finish and so you can see what the student sees. But we're going to click here for now and we're going to say we want three per page and then press go. Like I mentioned earlier, on the administration um, side here you can click preview to see what your student will see. And this is how they would see three questions per slide and then hit next when they want to continue. Quiz pages can also be sectioned off by creating section headers, which is here with the little pencil on top. You just click that, and it says Edit Heading, and you can just name it wherever you want, and you're just going to put Section A. Press Enter when you finish, and that's what it looks like. Maximum Grade. Um, this is a feature that tells you the maximum number of points that a student can attain on the quiz. If you click Shuffle here, it will randomize the order of questions that appear on a certain quiz section. Um, another way of manipulating the number of questions on a page are enabling and disabling the page breaks, which is located here on the side. And you could do so by that. And then questions can be rearranged by dragging or dropping using the crosshairs, which are these. And you can just change the order however you like to um, put on each uh, page or section here. Okay, um, now I'm going to turn it back over to Billy for a moment to discuss about revisiting your quiz settings. All right, so once your quiz has been composed of content and so once your uh, quiz has been composed of content from your question bank and is structured to your liking, it would be best, uh, best practice to then revisit your settings in your quiz. Now that you're knowledgeable of what questions are contained in the quiz and the expectations that you, as the instructor, will have for your students, now is the best time to finalize those settings that will shape the testing experience. So three settings that I would like you to consider are the timing, the grading, and the review option settings within your quiz. So. Now I'm going to share my screen once more so that I can show you where these settings live. All right, so screen. Sure. All right, so now we are back within our test eClass course. And now I'm going to go into test one, which is the quiz that um, Vanna just constructed for us now. So the way to get into our settings is going over here in the administration block and finding the button Edit Settings. Now, bear in mind that this is different from the Edit Quiz button. The Edit Quiz button was the feature we just used to create the structure for the quiz and bring in our questions. The Edit Settings is everything else with regards to the timing, grading, review options, and those little settings. And you may recognize this page as a page we saw before when we initially created our quiz. So, as you can see, we still have the same name and description from before. So now I would like to draw your attention to certain of the settings here below. 
So the first thing I'm going to go to is timing. So some things to consider with regards to how your quiz is going to be implemented is, so when should the quiz open and close? One uh, feature that we can have is have a specific date for this quiz to open. And after that date, the students will be able to submit responses to the quiz. So the way to do that, so let's say for test one, I want the quiz to open immediately after we're done today. So I'm going to click on the Enable button. And so this, the date is already set for the 22nd of March, 2016. And I'm going to say I want it to open at 1. So make this 0, 0. And on the hours field, you'll notice that it's in the 24-hour format. So for 1 o'clock, I have to put 13, because there's no option for AM, PM. So now it's set. So the quiz is going to become available at 1 o'clock today. So say I think, hmm, I'm going to be arbitrary and say, hey, uh, I think 26 hours are, is a nice arbitrary time limit. So I'm going to say, OK, so the quiz is going to close tomorrow, the 23rd, 23rd of March, 2016. And I said 26 hours, so it's going to be closing at 3 o'clock. So in the 12, uh, 24 hour format, that's going to be 15. All right, so now we have an open and close date for the quiz. So that provides a window of time where students would be able to submit responses and uh, complete the quiz. And after the close day, they wouldn't be able to do that anymore. So another consideration to make in the timing settings is, will the students have a time limit for completing the quiz? So that can be enabled right here in the time limit setting. So say I think 30 minutes is a fair window of time to complete the quiz. So I'm going to click on Enable. And now the field becomes open. So I'm going to go ahead and make it 30 minutes. And I'm going to make sure I have the correct unit of time that I want. So we can have seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks. I think weeks is a little excessive for this particular quiz. So I'm going to say 30 minutes. So and then one more thing to consider is if you do have a time limit, what is going to happen when the time expires? Because there's several settings for that right here, three settings. So you could have it set that open attempts are submitted automatically, which is actually my preferred setting. So for example, if you have a 25 question quiz and a student is at question 22 and types in their answer, and then suddenly the time expires. That means that all questions one through 22 will automatically be saved and submitted. However, those questions that they didn't get to attempt, 23, 24, 25, those would be recorded as empty too, as omitted answers. So another option is to have a grace period when open attempts can be submitted, but no more questions answered. So that means the time expires. And so if you're at question 22 and finish that, it means you can't submit responses for 23, 24, 25, but you can go back to 1 through 22 and work on those within that grace period. But you still have to go to the very end and hit the submit button before the grace period ends. And there's also. One last option, attempts must be submitted before the time expires or they are not counted. So by the 30 minute mark, a student would have had to complete every question, get to the last page and hit submit. Otherwise, their work is not saved. So, and if you do have a grace period, you just have to make the submission grace period enabled and choose how long you want it to be. I just arbitrarily put 10 minutes. So now I'm happy with my timing settings. Actually, no, because I told you that my personal preferences open attempts are submitted automatically. So I'm going to put that there instead. So now I'm happy with my timing settings, and I'm going to go ahead and close that. And now I'm going to share with you some grading settings to consider. So for instructors that are utilizing the eClass gradebook, one thing to consider is the grade category. So. As Kayla mentioned before, the quizzes within eClass grade automatically. So when the grades are generated, they're put automatically within the eClass gradebook. Now, for instructors that don't utilize this gradebook, it doesn't matter. It's automatically hidden, so the students are not going to get confused and see things they're not supposed to see. But for professors that do utilize the gradebook and they have categories and um, aggregations and everything set up, what you can do is you can go to the grade category and select which category you want this grade to be nested in. So I'm thinking, OK, test one, this is more of a low stakes grade. So I'm going to put it in the quizzes category. And then later on, if I go to the eClass gradebook, I'll see that this particular test 
is nested within that category. Another thing to consider is how many attempts a student can make. So if it's a very low stakes assessment or I just want to use this to like, you know, kind of guide the student to the right answer, I can have unlimited attempts allowed on the quiz and just like and just take it as many times as I need until I get it right. If it's a more high stakes assessment or an exam, I might decide, okay, you can make one attempt and that's it but you have many attempt options. You can have one through 10 or unlimited. So I'm just gonna say, hmm, I think three is a fair amount of attempts. So, and then I can choose my grading method. So of all of those attempts, what is the grade that's gonna stick? What's the one that's gonna count in the grade book? So I can choose highest grade, average grade of all the attempts, the first one or the last one. So I'm gonna say, what's it, whichever is your highest grade, that's when I'll count. So now I'm happy with my grade settings, and there's one last thing I want to consider, and that's our review options. So that is what the students will see and when they will see it. So we have four settings. This one we're going to disregard during the attempt, but there's during the attempt, immediately after the attempt, which is the two minute window after they click the submit button, later while the quiz is still open, which is after that two minute window, and after the quiz is closed. So if you have a closed date, after that closed date is reached, then this setting will come into effect. So you see that there's multiple options. So you can see the attempt. So what questions the student had and which order the questions were in and what their answers were, whether correct. So that's whether they were correct, partially incorrect or incorrect, just in plain text points, so how many points they got on specific questions, or overall, if the entire exam was automatically graded, a specific feedback, or general, or overall feedback, so all feedback options are there, and the right answer, so assuming they got the answer wrong, which is the right answer. So for some professors that are concerned about academic dishonesty, they could lock down the visibility of certain things, so they could take away all the feedback, take away the right answer, or they could have it like you only have things available in the two minute window and then after that while the quiz is still open everything disappears there's many options so depending on your tastes of what the student should have access to you can lock it down as much as you like so if you're really worried about academic dishonesty you could just take away everything so that immediately after the, after the attempt or later while the quiz is still open the students can see nothing but after the quiz is closed, then they can see everything. But this is after the quiz is closed when there's there when they are unable to sub make any submissions into the quiz. But this way, they can see everything. They can see feedback, answers, their attempts, so that if they so choose, they can use this quiz as a study guide. <sighs> well, so now I'm exceedingly happy with our settings now. So now that we've established these settings in our quiz, I'm going to go back into our quiz and see what's changed. So I'm going to save and display. All right, so now you'll see that there is a now description for timing and grading constraints that we established, warning the students before they begin. So we can see that there's three attempts allowed, when it's going to open, when it will close, the time limit, the grading method, everything is made very plain for them, so they have a warning. If I click on the preview quiz, and for them, it would just be a start attempt button. So let's get this confirmation so they know, OK, you have three attempts. Are you sure you want to start? And they can start. So this is the same view that Vanna showed us before. So we see in the quiz navigation feature, though, now we have the time left. So it's counting down from 30 minutes, because as you remember, that's the um, time limit that I established. So just to show you now what the student will see at the end of their exam. I'm just going to arbitrarily answer a few questions. Um, and I answered three questions, so I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to now just hit next through the rest of the pages. And now I'm at the end. So after you reach that last question, so my last question in this case was question eight. I click on next, and it brings us to this final page which is the summary of your attempt. So it shows you how many questions have been recorded. So in this case, I only, I kind of breezed through it, so I only answered one, two, and three. But I can see that 
4 through 8 weren't answered. So if I so choose, I could click on 4, and it would redirect me back to 4. So I'm going to do that right now. So I'm going to quickly answer question 4. And now I'm going to go back and breeze through, because I just wanted to answer question 4. So now I see that question 4 has been recorded. And I can see in this final summary that the time is still shown. So if I wanted to, I could, you know, um, I could uh, manage my time and decide, hey, I can go back, check my answers, or answer more questions if I so choose. But for this purpose, I'm going, and just for demonstration, I'm going to just hit Submit All and Finish. You see there's a confirmation, and I'm going to click on the Submit button, and my response is recorded. Now, this is what, this, under those settings that I made under Review Options, like the student can see whether they were correct or not, they just see a little transcript of their answers. When they started, when they finished, how much time they took, if all the settings for visibility were enabled, they would be able to see whether they were correct or not, how many points, and their grades, so on and so forth. But at this point, that would only become visible after that close date, as I mentioned. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Vanna. So once your quiz is open and once students have been making attempts or have opened attempts, how are you able to see their grades? How are you able to see the responses? So Vanna's going to take the wheel and show us all how to do that. So I'm going to stop sharing so that Vanna can start sharing her screen. Vanna, I don't think I got it. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Um... As Billy said, I'm going to discuss um, when students begin their making their attempts and submitting their work on eClass, the instructor will be able to see the student grade reports and full summaries of their attempts. To do this, the instructor should select attempts. Once you click on the page, you'll click attempts from all users who attempted the quiz. So once you get into a quiz, you'll see in the middle here it says attempts. This is how many people attempted your quiz. You click on that. Then, like I said, um, you'll go from the top here that says Attempts From, and we're going to click All Users Who Have Attempted the Quiz. So then you can see all your students' um, great reports. And then you would click Show Report here under Display Options. By doing that, you'll see all of your students' um, profiles here. Um, and you'll see it'll tell you uh, when each student has started or completed the quiz here the time that it took them to finish it, the grade, and all of their attempts to each question. You can also click on Review Attempt under the student's profile, and it will reveal the student's answers for each question. So, for example, we're going to use Billy here, and we're going to click Review Attempt under his profile. And by doing so, you'll see each um, question and each answer that he selected. Whether it was correct or incorrect, it'll say on the bottom. Um, please note that um, grade reports will not be able to track class achievement on individual questions if the quiz is composed of randomized questions. So if you go back here and you look at your graph, um, this is kind of showing, demonstrating like uh, your class or the students' um, grades upon like how they scored on the quiz pretty much. But if it's randomized, it'll be different. So I'm going to share it back with um, Kayla where she's going to discuss uh, considerations other considerations to the E-Class quiz. Okay, thanks, Vanna. So a few things to consider at the very end of our presentation here. Um, now that you've created your quiz, you know exactly the parameters that you're going to give your students, you know how to check their grades. Before you get started and you decide you want to do an exam online, there are a few things you should think about. First, it is going to take some time to create these exams. As you can tell, there are a lot of settings, a lot of decisions you have to make as you're developing your exam. Um, so if you decided on a Monday morning, I don't think I'm going to give my test in class today. I'm going to you know, put it online and have it available for two. You could do that, but you just keep in mind it may take you some time. We wouldn't recommend doing that, I guess is what I should say. 
Um, also, use those built-in strategies to reduce academic dishonesty. We had mentioned it a couple of times throughout the presentation because it is a concern of many faculty members who uh, have thought about putting their things online, but um, the LMS has allowed for specific strategies to kind of help reduce those opportunities. Uh, one is the question randomization, which we covered, and that will allow everybody to have a unique exam. Everybody's question one will be different from one student to the next and so on and so forth. You can limit your quiz time frame. So say you had a 10 question chapter quiz, um, maybe you only allow them 10 minutes to complete that so that they only have about one minute to answer each question. This is going to cut down on their time to be able to maybe open their book if they're at home taking the quiz and open their book or their notes and try to find the answer. You can limit those review options, which is I think probably one of the best ways to prevent academic dishonesty or cheating. Um, limiting the review options to only allow all of your students to see their correct answers or their results until after the quiz has closed for everybody. Um, this will prevent them from sharing answers with each other. They won't be able to print out their exam and hand it to their friend and go home and take the quiz and get all the right answers. Um, and lastly, utilize different question types. Um, some multiple choice questions, of course, are, are useful and help you gauge students' knowledge, but supplement them with those essay and short answer questions because those are going to allow for more synthesis and more creative thinking, and that's going to cut down on the chances of the student being able to look something up in a book. You won't be able to make any major changes to the questions after you have made the quiz available to students. Uh, what that means is you can't add or delete any questions. If you change your mind about maybe a question that you've added to the quiz, but the quiz is already open, you can't delete it. However, you can revise and edit the questions that you've added. For example, if you notice you made a typo and you want to go back and just revise that, you can do that. You just can't add or delete anything once the quiz has begun. And as Vanna just mentioned, you want to keep in mind that if you do randomize your questions, that may have an effect on grade tracking. So if you are interested in collecting data about your quizzes at the end, um, for example, which questions they all got wrong or all got right, how many questions, and so on and so forth, if you do choose to randomize, just keep in mind that that data may not be as accurate because of the randomization. For some instructors that we've interacted with using the quiz feature, they have found that it's best for low stakes exams, such as those short chapter quizzes, or even practice for high class or high stakes in class exams. For example, a lot of professors um, do these short chapter quizzes throughout the semester and um, then have an in class high stakes exam um, that kind of reflects the short chapter quizzes they've put on e-class. Uh, but it's totally up to you. You can certainly put your um, cumulative exams online. It's totally a personal preference. We've just found that the uh, professors that we've helped create quizzes, they've preferred them to be for the more low stakes exams. And lastly, we'd like to let you know that we have created a video for students um, who may be interacting with the quiz feature on eClass, and it's called 10 Strategies for Online Test Taking. And basically, it was, it was with those students in mind who may be taking online exams. Obviously, they are different than in-class exams, and um, so we wanted to present them with some opportunities to learn how they can do their best in those online exams. That video can be found on our YouTube channel and on our website, which I will share the links with in a few. So if you're interested in designing and implementing an online quiz, this doesn't need to be the last time you talk to us about it. You can certainly make an appointment with one of us and we can sit down with you and make sure that the quiz feature is meeting all of your needs and that all the settings are correct and, and so on and so forth. So feel free to call us or email us and make an appointment with one of us if you so choose. So at this time, we would like to open it up for a question and answer. You can use the chat feature to do that. Um, and if you're watching the recording of this webinar and you're not with us live, you can always email us any questions using the email. I'm going to put my little uh, pointer here on using this email here, onlinelearning at msmc.edu. Most of our staff here in the office have access to this email, so um, one of us will be bound to find it and respond to you. And um, also, uh, Sonia and Anne-Marie, I know you guys are full-time faculty, so I know your email address is already. Um, but if you have a different preferred email address that you would prefer us to send the email to, please let us know. Um, we're going to email you the link to the recording. We're going to email you a PDF document that our office has created that basically talks about all the things we talked about today, all of the settings, all of that having to do with quizzes. It's just in a document format, so you can print it off and keep it as a resource. And we will also have a PDF of our slideshow today so that you can print that off as well. 
So if you don't want to send to your MSMC address, just let us know in the chat box and we'll send it to another preferred address. Um, you can see our links to our resource website is here, onlinelearning.msmc.edu. That resource website functions for both instructors and students. We have resources for instructors on there regarding e-class and instructional design. And then we have things for um, students on there regarding things like the, the 10 strategies video. Um, we also have things about netiquette, which is online etiquette, how to do your best in online courses. We have things about discussion forum basics for students. So definitely take a look around our website and see if there's anything that you would like to utilize as part of your course or your teaching. And last, lastly, we have our YouTube channel link, which is um, another way to kind of watch all of the resources we've created having to do with e-class, instructional design, and general online learning topics. Anne Marie asks, I have used quizzes online for five years. Sometimes they jam. Is there a snafu approach for this? So Anne Marie, what do you mean by they jam? Did, what do you mean by that exactly? Do you mean that they uh, freeze up and students aren't able to take them successfully or? I would suggest making a one-on-one -on -one appointment with one of us. Maybe we could take a closer look and make sure the settings are all the way you want them to be. I do know some students have um, called us sometimes in a panic and said, oh, I just got locked out of my quiz, but they don't realize that there's been a time constraint put on it or um, they've gotten locked out because of that reason. So I would suggest maybe making an appointment with somebody and we can sit down and just make sure all of your settings are correct. I can see Anne Marie is typing, so I'm just going to give her a moment to respond here. She asks, is it possible to make case-based questions three to four sentences long, or are there limits on question size? I don't believe there's any limit about how long your questions can be. Um, Billy, do you know of anything like that? Billy has a lot of experience with the quiz feature, so I'm going to ask him just to make sure. Not that I'm aware. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is no limit, like you know, three or four sentences as long is definitely possible. Um, it's also possible if you have like multiple questions that you want to all be based on the same text or same case uh, study or whatever information you're providing, you can uh, make a, um, if you noticed on the question type uh, function menu, um, there's a description. So you could make a text and have that be the three or four sentence long and then have that at the beginning of a quiz page and the quiz uh, questions following that could all be related to that description text, if that helps. And Amory also asked about uploading images and media to your quiz, and I can, um, yes. So I'm going to go ahead, um, Amory, I'm going to share my screen one more time so I can show you exactly how to do that. Uh, basically, um, I'm going to go ahead, share now. So basically, all the quiz functions, um, the text and such, is built using the standard HTML text editor that you might have seen when you are building your quiz, uh, your e-class course. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to access the quizzes by going back into the question bank and clicking on questions. So the ones that I uh, personally made today were in test one category. I'm just going to choose one. Um, I'm going to go with the Mesopotamia question. I, so, what, um, so as you can see, like this was the form that we used to build the multiple choice question. It is made with the same standard um, HTML text editor that is commonly found in eClass. So what I'm going to do is you can see these functions right here. There's uh, inserting, and, uh, inserting and editing images, inserting Moodle media, managing embedded files. So it is possible to add media. So um, photos, uh, embedding YouTube videos, sound clips, if you like to use that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. And I did, uh, while you posed that question, I did upload a um, image, uh, download an image to my computer just that, so that we can demonstrate. So just to go over what I did is I clicked on this um, insert edit image button. And I'm going to find or upload an image. And it's on my computer, so I'm going to upload a file, choosing a file. So it's the same process for uh, adding an image elsewhere in your eClass course. 
So I'm just going to I put it in pictures. So I'm just going to navigate to where I have the picture. And I'm going to click on upload this file. Insert. Yes. All right, so as you can see now, in our text editor, I added the question. Uh, I added the photo to our question text. So this is going to accompany the question prompt um, when it appears in the student quiz. We can also do this for our feedback areas. So maybe if you want to refer someone to a um, YouTube video or some resource online, you could um, do that, or you can have media there as part of your feedback to refer students to. So, uh, yeah, so, and you can have photos as well as your answer options. Or, like, I just put texts because that was the simplest demonstration that I could give you to save time. But you can go more in depth with sound, clips, photos, if you so wish. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save the changes that I just made with the photo. And when I preview that question one, you can see now that the photo comes up. So I hope that uh, answers your question with regards to adding photos. Um, uh, copyright issues. Um, well, I mean, of course, like I just grabbed this map from a, a um, website. So what I would recommend is, um, I mean, looking for open source um, documents and photos is a good practice. I would also say. Um, citing your sources. Um, for example, I recently uh, made a um, tutorial for the education division um, for those freshman students that are uh, about to take their um, education proficiency exams. And I had some resources uh, through uh, Khan Academy and um, resources provided by the Center for Student Success. So I just um, cited all my sources as a best practice. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, as long as you're being uh, diligent, I don't perceive a problem. Thanks, Billy. I'd also like to add for you, Anne-Marie, that the, the library, specifically Dan, Derek Sanderson, um, he's the representative, I think, for copyright and fair use when it comes to online media. So he'd be also a great person to ask if you have any questions about copyright issues. Also, Kristen is really knowledgeable about copyright as well. So we do have some other people around that could definitely answer that question to a little bit of a higher degree than uh, myself or Vanna or Billy could. And in addition, another a webinar that we are offering in this uh, Lunch and Learn series is going to be on um, copyright and fair use. So that would be something to look out for as well. And uh, possibly more. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, Kristen and Derek are the ones who are going to be presenting that webinar. So um, I would definitely encourage you to check that one out. I can't remember exactly when it is, but as part of the email I send, I'll attach the flyer that has all the upcoming webinars for you, for you, Anne-Marie and, and Sonia. Okay, so if nobody has any other questions, uh, we can close out our webinar. But if you do have questions later on about the quiz feature, of course, you can email us or call us and we can, um, you know, help you as far, as much as we can. Okay, so to exit the webinar, all you have to do is click the red X in the top right corner. Thank you both Anne-Marie and Sonia for attending today. We really appreciate it. And we'll be in touch soon with our email.